We are live. All right, folks. We are going live. I'm just waiting for a few seconds to get this up and going. I am Danny Terrell. I am the curator for Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. Welcome to a special intimate conversations, physical distancing, intercom physical distancing, intimate conversations with board members of Black Lives Matter. Before we jump into conversation and meet the board members and meet our panelists, I want to read our mission, vision, and values. Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas is the only local nonprofit organization solely dedicated to presenting emerging Black arts, artists, and ideas in the Seattle area. We believe in the value of community, creativity, identity, and passion. These values serve as our strategic frame and guide to day-to-day -day operations and programs program decisions. We work out of links of the historic Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute, an 80-day compliant facility rich with culture and history. Our mission to provide a platform for provocative arts and ideas that foster awareness of and involvement in Black experiences. Our vision, we envision a world where cultural experiences are valued. Um, I wanted to have this conversation because of what is taking place, what is going on in the world, uh, especially with the death of, of black men and women that has been happening um, for centuries, but there's something a little different that's happening now. And we are also in the midst of a pandemic and we are also in the midst of people just fed up. And today I wanted to talk to some of the organizers of the movement here in uh, King County, Seattle, Washington, and they're organizing in a different way. So I want to bring in Ebony Miranda, they, them pronouns, and Marlon Brown, he, him pronouns from Black Lives Matter. Hello, Ebony and Marlon, how are you all doing? Hello. And let me ask that question differently, the way right. that I want to ask the question. <laughs> um, what's moving through your body during this time? Hmm. It's a good, good <laughs> question. <laughs> it's kind of been a a roller coaster of emotions for me. I think um, obviously what is riding underneath all of this is that I'm just very angry at the state of a lot of things right now. I'm right. angry that uh, black people are once again being asked to risk their lives uh, to fight for their livelihood and their communities. Um, but also I am feeling very inspired and supported by our community here in Seattle as well. The support that our chapter has been getting has been really incredible and something that I never thought I'd see before. So while there are a lot of difficult emotions flowing through me right now and I'm trying to do everything I can to process those, um, I'm also feeling very motivated um, awesome. and hopeful. Thank you for that, Marlon. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm the same. Uh, there's a lot swirling as far as emotions. Um, we're super busy, not just with the work of Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County, but in our personal lives, our personal jobs. We have jobs, you know, we got families and things and right. so just trying to keep up with all of that as well as this um this work which is you know has just catapulted us into um interesting places so um but moving this work um yeah it just stirs up everything but um i feel um we're a really good team and we're supporting each other very well um and we're getting some more support from the community so uh that helps a lot but uh, it is a lot to deal with. Awesome. And can you all go through the history, the vision, mission of Black Lives Matter, Seattle, King County, and the entire Black Lives Matter organization globally? All right, everybody. Everybody. You know, just just, uh, just uh, like, what is Black Lives Matter? And then break it down, what is Black Lives Matter, King County? Seattle, King County. Okay. Right. Um, do you want to go through the national history, Marlon, and I'll take over the local history. Yeah. So the national history, um, about five, six years ago, um, uh, Patrice 
oh gosh, I'm gonna mess up the last names, but Patrice, uh, Alicia and Opal pretty much kicked it off with a hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, in the aftermath of Trayvon Martin's uh, murder by uh, George Zimmerman. And then some from there, uh, they really got catapulted into um, mainstream uh, organizing uh, a number of, uh, uh, of events and, and protests uh, of these uh, situations continue to happen and then the surfacing of more and more videos. Uh, and then um, a movement really uh, emerged and some organization and pulling infrastructure together to um, uh, develop Black Lives Matter, you know, which is, what is now called Black Lives Matter Global, um, mm -hmm. um, has you know resulted even in these five years. So um, yeah, they're continuing to evolve uh, their reach and um, presence. Uh, is spanning not just the United States, but it's actually global. Uh, there's presences of uh, Black Lives Matter in other countries as well. Um, and as a local chapter, um, this chapter, Black Lives Matter Seattle King County was co-founded by myself and two other individuals at the end of 2017. Um, and then I can just read you our mission statement, um, which I think encapsulates what our chapter is about. So Black Lives Matter Seattle King County is a grassroots volunteer run social justice nonprofit organization focused on the empowerment and liberation of black people and other people of color through advocacy and direct action. BLM Seattle centers leadership on black women, femmes, trans, and queer people organizing and taking direct action to dismantle anti-black systems of policy and oppression. So awesome. I would say that, yeah, is a very good civil statement on what we stand for to this day. Yeah, Thank absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you are tuning in also, we will have a moment where you can ask questions. If you type your questions in the comments, we will feed through those questions and make sure that your questions get answered. Um, the first thing I wanna kick it off with you all, what makes this round of protests different than before? Um. And let me clear that up for a second. Yeah. Just <laughs> let me clear that up for a second. It feels, the energy feels different. The energy yeah. feels, um, it, it feels much more urgent than before. It feels much more, um, I don't wanna say desperate, but it, it, it feels something different now. What do you think in your opinion makes this different than before? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I can't speak to all that has happened in the past, but as someone who did participate, I uh, participated in quite a few protests back in 2015, I believe, after the ruling for uh, the officer who murdered Mike Brown and the energy in that, that was a, again, probably Seattle's like first also real big spike in Black Lives Matter activity, 2014, 2015 there. Um, and there was a lot of momentum and there was a lot of energy like we're seeing now, but I think now in the context of this pandemic already clearly showing the cracks in our government, in our society, people were already getting hip to how few resources and care our government really has for marginalized people. And then to put in that context, uh, the reminder, if you will, for lack of a better term, that police brutality and institutionalized racism doesn't stop when the world stops. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just amplifies that. Also, it's an election year. People are feeling this really big momentum to make change in multiple ways. Um, and I was out there last night and, you know, the fact that people are essentially at Cal Anderson 24 seven now. I've never seen, uh, at least in the time that I lived in Seattle, that type of dedication and energy being put into it. Um, it is it is different. People are really looking to see things change drastically. 
Marlon, you want to speak on that? Or? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a different energy. Uh, I think that um, the more, unfortunately, the more that these videos are shown, the more people are moving past, you know, not believing or conceiving that these types of actions uh, truly uh, happen to Black bodies. And now um, the evidence is made very plain to everyone that this is a consistent, and it has been a consistent uh, attitude and approach to black bodies from law enforcement uh, agencies across the country, uh, even uh, in other countries as well. So, um, you know, with that, you know, people are, uh, people who are, you know, not black are, are really realizing and recognizing that, you know, if, if the conversation is, you know, um, who really matters in this country? And you want to say that, you know, we're all, you know, created, you know, uh, treated fairly that, you know, well, you, you got to take into consideration these videos and why these are happening beyond just trying to pick apart somebody's background and, you know, uh, excuse away why law enforcement would uh, would treat black bodies the way that they have in these videos. So it's it's becoming very apparent, apparent that um, something else has to happen. And all the time that we've been saying that our lives matter and we're not being treated like, like uh, others are being treated is now really coming to the surface. Awesome, thank you, Marlon. Um, Ebony, I want this question for you. What happens after marches and protests and, and people really taking to the streets is that we, be, we become really complicit and complacent and we stop until the next thing happens. Um, how do we make sure that the works that protesters are doing in the street, organizers, Black Lives Matter, um, how do we make sure that this work does not stop after we feel like it has calmed down? I think there are a few parts to this question. Um, I remember this came up a lot because I was uh, I was one of the organizers for the first Women's March in Seattle uh, in 2017. And it was, I guess in a way, now that I think about it, similar where a lot of people were, I guess, coming to the realization that things were not so great in this country and really wanted to, they were feeling motivated and they wanted action. And so everyone always said, what do we do after this? What do we do after this big moment? And for me personally, I always tell people, uh, no matter how small the action that it needs to be consistent. So that can be donating, that can be uh, staying up to date with the organizations that you choose to follow and uh, keeping up with the work that they are doing, what policies they are working on, um, what community updates they have for people. There are a lot of uh, moving pieces in all of this, which I think is important for folks to know as well. I mean, we're in this moment now, but over the last two years, our board and our chapter has been doing work. You know, it just hasn't maybe been on this grand scale, especially in terms of direct action and protesting. Um, so once this has all calmed down, um, in whatever sense that looks like, um, I first encourage folks to really reflect on what they learned in this process. I think we're all learning, Black people included, myself included, are learning where our place is in this movement, where our, um, our dedication is being tested right now. Like, can I do this work? Can I sustain this? If not, what do I need to adjust? Um, and so I think folks need to reflect on what they do best, what is the most impactful work they can do, whether it's using your privilege, your money, your resources, your knowledge, and then how to apply that on a consistent basis. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I, I wanna talk about what's happening in Seattle a little bit later, because I know a lot of people have questions about that, but this is um, something that I think it's really important to talk about that we are not talking about. Um, I'm trying to adjust my camera. So I'm like in the shot. Um, how in this movement do we decenter cis black men? Because we know that black women and black girls are getting killed by the police. We know that black trans women are getting killed, not just by the police, but by the hands of other folks. Um, 
we know what happened to Ayana Dior, um, that we're not talking about that. Um, she was a black trans woman. She was a black trans woman that was protesting and she got brutally beaten. Um, how do we decenter cis black men and start making sure that globally, nationally, locally, we are talking about the effects of Black Lives Matter on the black trans community and black women. Marlon, let's start with you, cis man. Of course, while I'm drinking, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think it really starts with us, you know, as a cisgender black man to put that at the forefront. You know, if I'm on my social medias, you know, and um, because we know that big stream, mainstream media is not going to cover these stories. So um, it's really uh, incumbent on, upon us uh, cis uh, black men to actually raise that awareness and actually push our um, big media um, outlets to really cover those stories so that they get uh, the recognition that they need and the, and, and the response because um, we know um, statistically and by the data that uh, black trans women are killed at an alarming rate uh, and it's not getting the response and support that um, black men are getting in this country. I mean, we can see it, you know, the, the, the demonstrations are not showing up the same way when black trans women are attacked so um, and killed. So um, that's something, that's the work that we, uh, you know, as our, you know, as the black community, we as black cis men, uh, we need to really step it up. And that is, that is, Nicely put and ethically put and, and, and said, but how do we put that into action? Because that has been within the queer and trans community with black women, that has been the 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 battle cry for so long. Mm -hmm. We wait until another cis black man, and please don't think that I'm I'm taking his death in vain or I'm 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 putting anything negative on it, but I'm a part of a queer community. I'm a non-conforming person. Um I'm hearing the, the cries from, from the community that I'm in. And so how do we no longer talk about, we must do this and actually put it into action? What are the tangible ways, if you have any, that we can not center just cis men in these protests and rallies and marches? I, mean, I also wanna bring up Tony McDade, who was a black trans man that was killed by the police that no one's really talking about unless you're in the queer trans community and you're black. I know that was a lot, but uh, Ebony, would you like to take that one? Um, yeah, well, I, I first have a few thoughts about the, the first part of the question that you asked, because I think a really big part of this is um, looking back on our history, right? Mm -hmm. Black women, black trans folks, black trans women have all been at the forefront or played a vital role in pretty much all major social justice movements, women's rights, uh, queer and trans rights, black rights and civil rights. Um, look at any major movement and, and they've been there. You know, they've been at the front lines. They've been the ones creating change and having their influence. It's also, it can be the same said for writing, arts, all of these things they have touched. Right. And that includes the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. It was started by three black women. And I believe if not all of them or a couple of them are queer as well. And they've also made that very known. So I think part of that is, um, and I don't say this to, to lift myself up, but is to, as our chapter does, make sure that the leadership and that the uh, that the narrative has that experience of Black trans women or Black women and femmes and queer and trans folks always considered in these right. decisions that we're making. Um, and I also say that for myself as someone who is Black and queer and trans, um, I think about these things a lot because I too am not feeling represented in right. uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing, which I find is very hard at times. And I, I do think about uh, Tony McDade a lot as that's someone that um, in a way aligns with how I identify. Um, I don't identify as a man, but I'm still a black trans person. Um, right. And that puts me at risk 
And I think about that every time I'm out there and I think about my, my safety in that. Um, so in terms of really pushing this forward, I mean, I, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard question to kind of answer in one mm -hmm. sentence. Cause I think there's just so much work that needs to be done. There's so much work that needs to be done in uh, yeah. our communities to really get folks to understand and then empathize with the queer and trans experience for them to learn our history. And that this isn't something that just popped up in the 21st century. Black queer and trans folks have been here. We have been doing the work. We have been vital to these movements yes. and we still are, and we still continue to be, and we're not going anywhere. So. Yeah. I think just not even being vital, we are pushing the movement. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of times that I see those that are speaking, those that are in the uh, front lines, especially like Black queer films. Um, they are out there fighting for people that at times, a lot of times don't care about them. Um, and so we, we have to recognize who's actually leading our movements also. Um, and uh, thank you all for that. I, I really wanted to touch on that because they're, um, um, the Black trans community is hurting right now. Mm -hmm. um, their community is hurting because uh, those voices are not being heard um, in the idea of Black Lives Matter um, and not targeting the organization, but people are chanting Black Lives Matter. And sometimes it's with like, accepts <laughs> Black Lives Matter, but you must be. Right. And so I really wanted to like touch on that to make sure that we're we're starting that conversation and 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 in that conversation even more. So thank you both for that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to switch to what's happening in Seattle. Um, where do we start? Mm -hmm. That is like, that is, that's mm -hmm. the part that I'm like, I don't even know where to start. Uh, let's start with, um, you all released yesterday that you met with the mayor and there was a list of demands. And if we can bring that up, can we just go through those lists of demands again? Um, just so folks can see those if you don't, if you have not seen it, if we can bring that up and pull that up on screen, give us a second. We're working through this tech folks. And it's, um, a, running, it's a running list too. Um, okay. You know, further earlier in this week, we started with, you know, a subset of those demands with the mayor, um, in our, well, with our elected officials actually with, um, with our uh, press release. And so since then, through a number of conversations, those demands have, um, you know, broadened, gotten, you know, we've added more to them as well as, you know, as we're hearing from the community, the community is coming to us saying, hey, these are the things that are happening on the ground and we're adding them to the list and we're um, bringing them up to um, uh, government officials as we're having those conversations so that they uh, begin to work on them. And, um, we have had some progress uh, with uh, the demands that we've given so far. And the, the list isn't closed, you know, as more things are coming up from the community, we're adding mm -hmm. them to the list and having the conversations with uh, elected officials. Right. Awesome. I think, yeah. Oh, I was just, I was just going to say really quick. I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. The things that we're working on now are just for the immediate, but with the full intent of knowing that we have an infinite list essentially of issues that harm black people that need to be worked on um, in the city of Seattle and in King County as a whole. Can you go through uh, the list of demands uh, right now? I see six of them, but can you go through those six that we're looking at on the screen? And which ones have been met, and which ones still need to be met? So um, these are just the first set of six that uh, is just on the list. They're not in any particular order. Uh, and then what's in black is the demand, what's in red is the update. So um, the, uh, uh, the rescinding of the um, motion to lift the cassette decree that's over the police department, that was rescinded. Uh, that's what's in, in red. Um, the mayor uh, lifted the curfew um, as uh, demanded. And then, um, uh, we demand that all law enforcement demonstrations uh, that all there that the law enforcement officers body cams are on and turned on, um, recognizing that that is a a huge ask. And lots of other things need to be in place of uh, policies and procedures. Um, um, Chief made it. Um, oh, and, oh, I think this is about their um, 
um, sorry, about their um, badges and the bands. Uh, the, the chief released uh, a statement about how to properly use that black band when they're recognizing a fallen uh, officer. That's usually what that, that band um, um, signifies. And so there's instructions on what they need to do with that. Um, but we are continuing to work on those, the body cams, uh, but the um, uh, mayor agreed that the body cams should be on. Uh, we demanded that the city establish an, a de-escalation team uh, and divest um, funds from the police department, particularly around military, militarized weapons uh, that are that we see on the full display uh, during this protest uh, to de de divest that funds uh, from those type of, uh, of, of tools into um, de-escalation teams, street outreach, crisis intervention, mental health. And so the mayor uh, agreed to um, to that divestment um, and is still working on a plan. And so that's ongoing as well. Um, we demand the holes of the I-940 um, uh, initiative. That's, a, um, that's an initiative, that's a statewide initiative on um, these matters, particularly with the de-escalation, but more so about the um, uh, investigations when mm -hmm. there's a police officer involved homicide or harm or injury, um, that those that those investigations leave that particular agency and go to another agency to uh, be investigated. We worked with the, we're working with the governor to improve that, but the governor released a statement that uh, in the case of um, Manny Ellis uh, in Tacoma, that that investigation is going to be pulled out of Pierce County and into the state. Um, uh, state police department to do the investigation. Uh, and there's, there's more coming around that as well. Uh, the demand for ending the homeless encampment sweeps, uh, the mayor agreed uh, that change needs to happen with that. She has uh, a tentative plan. The Urban League um, uh, piped in and said that they had some data that they wanted to share and contribute to the conversation. So that's an ongoing thing as well. Awesome. Um, thank you. Yeah, we have another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the demand for um, fair enforcement uh, to be abolished, that's going to the county um, uh, here relative, re really soon, as well as fair enforcement, uh, the sus suspension of fares, transit fares for the, for the rest of the year. That's uh, up to the county as well. Um, there is a inquest lawsuit that the city filed with the, the, the county, the city filed with the county yes. that is holding up the implementation, further implementation of the I-940 um, uh, initiative. And we've asked for that to be um, um, uh, removed as well. And the mayor is going to talk to um, city attorney Pete Holmes about that. Um, the demand to, for community oversight when it comes to police um, bargaining process. That's an ongoing work, but the mayor agreed that um, that 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 needs to be um, a reality. Community oversight on that. The uh, community police commission that's already you know pulled together uh, and active in the um, city also expressed interest in that oversight. So we're going to work together with them uh, and the mayor's office to ensure that that happens. The demand for uh, fully funded Black Commission to address these issues and for future issues. The mayor agreed to its formation, staffing, and funding for that commission as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next thing I'm about to say is surely just the opinion of Danny Terrell. It does not reflect Black Lives Matter, nor Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. I want to put that out there and be very clear. This is just me. So... Last night, Capitol Hill, um, the news was that the mayor was going to stop the use of tear gas and chemical weapons on those that are, that are rising up in the streets. That did not happen. Um, there was a report that uh, one of our community members got attacked through this tear gas. Um, do you all have anything to say about that? Right. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, um, that is a, 
I think it kind of opens up what needs to start happening in terms of uh, education and learning about uh, what the police are doing and what they're equipped with. Um, because according to the Seattle Police Department, they were not using tear gas. Uh, they were using pepper spray and flashbangs. Um, but that doesn't mean that those don't count as chemical weapons either. So mm. I think there needs to be more transparency right. and resources available for the community to understand exactly what these officers have on them when they are in a situation like that. There needs to be more transparency of what um, yeah, chemical weapons they are equipped with and are allowed to deploy, what they look like, what chemicals they have in them, um, how far they can be thrown, the radius that the fumes from them can be spread, et cetera, et cetera, because I think um, it's causing a lot of confusion and panic, which is 100% understandable. We don't know right. if it's tear gas still or if it is something else because they're not being transparent with that. Right. And because there's so much distrust already based on what we've witnessed, um, there needs to be more accurate and clear communication on exactly what that is. Um, so we can truly understand and determine what it is they're doing. And then from there, um, make the request to make adjustments in that if it's harmful, because it is, obviously. Right. So those are my thoughts on that. Okay, so this is another Danny Terrell that does not represent anybody else but myself. Uh, between the mayor's office and the Seattle Police Department, who lying? <laughs> like, <laughs> where is the breakdown in communication? Again, I represent <laughs> Danny Terrell right now, not Black Lives Matter, nor since you just call for arts and ideas. Because let's just, I just, I'm going to break it down and let's just have some real conversation because mm -hmm. that was definitely something that people were excited about. And then something else happened last night. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like I'm watching the news again, looking and reading between the mayor's office and SPD, the chief of police and the mayor, something is not gelling with communication with them. And I know you have been in conversation with them what have those conversations felt like? And again, we're just trying to get information out of the black people. You want, you want me to share or you want to go? Um, I'm just thinking. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Yeah, why don't, why don't you go first, Marlon, and then I yeah. will add my thoughts. And you don't have to answer the question. I just want to throw that out. <laughs> I would like to if I can, um, if I feel like yeah. I have something useful <laughs> to answer with. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, the perception that we have um, is what we're operating out of and what we see, you know, this display on the on the TV, on these videos, um, you know, perception is reality in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we we can't speak to what, you know, is really happening between uh, the mayor's office and the police department, you know, but um we're we're experiencing some type of breakdown, you know. Mm -hmm. If if in our conversations we're saying that these things are happening, and then folks on the ground are sharing footage and, and experiences of something completely different, you know, it really just makes that that gulf and this communication um, even bigger, and the tr uh, and it really reinforces the this distrust that the community has with law enforcement. And so that is definitely some work that they need to do. Um, and we are really asking the questions and holding them accountable. So if you're saying this one thing, but this is what's happening on the ground, why is there this, there's this disconnect? And where is it coming from? You know, you guys are investigators. Tell us, <laughs> tell us the truth, you know? And I, I, would, I would believe that, you know, we, we're talking about, um, a culture, a culture that um, has not always been um, upfront about you know everything that's going on, um, but particularly for Black folks, we've never you know experienced good things from police officers. So you know it's it's that culture that they need to really work on, um, and it has been brought up several times to uh, the mayor and to. Uh, SPD about the way in which we're approached. So um, a lot goes into this, but you know, to really pull back the layers of what's happening 
um, between uh, or within the city, you know, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll never know, but we're definitely asking a lot of questions and the community is even asking a lot of questions. What is going on and why is there such, why does it feel so jarred? Right. Ebony, would you like to take that on? Um, I mean, I think that covers it. And I think it just goes back to the point where it's just like, we as individuals are just trying to do everything we can to get clear answers to report back to our communities. And mm -hmm. it makes our job extremely more difficult if we have a meeting in the morning and it's confirmed that they're not using chemical or at least tear gas in this case. Right. And then, you know, we're now having to search up live streams and being like, wait, they're deploying tear gas. What's happening? Didn't we just exactly. talk about this? So um, it is it is frustrating for us as well in that right. process as we try to do everything we can to support folks who are out there right now. Thank you. What is it that uh, what is it that black folks need to know about um, policy and law and change? There's a lot of demands to defund the police, and we know some things are not as easy as it may seem. Mm -hmm. um, I want to use this time and this platform to really talk to Black folks about what can we do that is also we're in the street, we're protesting, we're marching, we're rising up, and what can we do sitting at our computer, what can we do with going down to city hall and going, what What are other ways that we can fight this battle if we're not the type that go in the street and protest? Right. I mean, I think a good, well, I'll start by saying that I think it's important for everyone to understand that folks who are, you know, us on the board we represent Black Lives Matter, but and we are fighting for these issues, but that doesn't mean that we've also had to do our own research on these uh, mm -hmm. issues ourselves and that we are also learning and adjusting and researching and trying to understand exactly what it is in these policies that need to change and exactly how they're harmful. I've had to do a lot of research, um, a lot of learning, a lot of understanding. I don't have a law degree. I'm not a politician. Um, I went to music school, like, I, like I'm like i an artist at the end of the day. Um, so for me, it's taken a lot of work uh, to fully understand. And so when I am in these meetings, I know how to communicate and right. really be direct on what needs to change. So with that, I would say that um, folks who are starting to become aware of these organizations or coalitions who are listing their demands, look at those demands and see exactly what policies they are criticizing or demanding change for and look that up. For example, we have a demand for the city to withdraw the lawsuit against the county for the inquest process. Um, there are a lot of articles very deliberately explaining what exactly that means. Um, mm -hmm. Same with the why uh, the city attorney rescinding the motion for the consent decree. I didn't fully understand what that meant at first, um, but it was suggested by one of our board members. And I was like, okay, let me look this up. Yes, this makes a lot of sense. So I think following the steps that we've taken um, to list those demands, they are extremely curated and tailored to our community. So researching those. So you know, if you are out there protesting, if people are asking, why is this um, a thing? Why are they saying that? Do that education for yourself because it really just empowers everyone. Everybody should be learning about everything, to put it simply. Awesome. Thank you. Um, can we bring up the protester safety guide? Uh, this is this is um, on your website, and I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, it is important that as you all are out in the street and you are protesting, and I don't even want to say the word protesting, as you are showing up uh, for change across this nation, you all need to stay safe. Can you go through like two or three points that that folks can think about? as they are out in the streets rising up? I would say uh, the two most uh, critical things, I really wanna emphasize uh, phone safety. Phone safety and privacy is huge when you're going out there. Of course, COVID-19 safety as well. Please right. wear your masks. Please socially distance when you can. Please have hand sanitizer. Um, 
because I'm not seeing a lot of that out there right now. That is concerning and we want to stay as safe as possible. But in terms of way to prepare yourself for the act of demonstrating, especially in uh, law enforcement presence, phone safety and right. privacy is huge. Um, and knowing exactly what it is you need to bring and leaving everything else at home. Um, you don't want possessions that uh, are at risk of being stolen to be with you. They don't need to be, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, and everyone, if you want to um, look at the uh, protester safety guide, it's on your website, Seattle, Black Lives Matter, Seattle.org, correct? Yes, it's right there at the bottom of the screen. Go on the website and look up that. Um, I want to start opening it, it up to um, some questions that we have on the slide. If anyone has any questions, please ask them. Um, a few things that, I, what's next for the organization? There is, um, I've heard, and I don't want to say this person's name wrong, Dagny Safan. If I said your name wrong, I apologize. But I've heard about a Black Lives Matter Seattle King County Organized March on June 12th. Are there more details about protests coming? So what, do you have any like more details about that or we still need to just wait would you like to answer that, Marlon, or I can answer? Like that? Bad, I, that I was like, "Do we just need to wait?" That was so bad. Recognize <laughs> <laughs> how horrible that was. No, uh, <laughs> it is. Oh yeah, go ahead, Marlon. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot. This is a huge undertaking for uh, for us, um, and there's a lot of um, moving parts, and we're trying to get our arms around all those moving parts. One because we're highly concerned about safety, the way in which you know um, demonstrations has happened before, and, and, and particularly when our bodies are out on the street, we, we are really concerned about that safety, and um, we're working on those details, socially distancing, having PPE, and making sure that we are, are able to provide some. You know, I know people are gonna come with their masks, but you know, we wanna really ensure that folks are covered and protected. Um, and you know, you know, there's a huge thing about safety for us black body, our black bodies. And so um, you know, we're really working on you know that safety part because we don't want anyone injured. Um right. we really want to, you know, dissuade any, you know, these air quote bad actors. Um, you know, this is intended to be a peaceful um march, uh, and it's a day of action, you know, it's really calling a, a pause. Uh, uh, statewide uh, that everyone can participate in. There will be an online element if you can't physically be, you know, here in Seattle, if you can't, you know, for health reasons or distance reasons or whatever, or income reasons, you can participate online. There's, there will be that. Um, but it, it's still a lot of details to try to pull together. Um, but we will be releasing something very, very soon. Right. Um, I would say First and foremost, follow us on our Facebook page if you do not already. Um, that will be a great resource for all details and we've been updating that regularly. Um, but yes, it will be Friday, June 12th. Uh, we have decided that uh, things will start at, have we decided to start? <laughs> no I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wipe that off, right? It will be Friday, <laughs> June 12th. What you need to know right now, and I say follow our Facebook page for the rest of the details. Um, because as Marlon said, we are like actively getting this all together for everyone. Um, so it'll be Friday, June 12th, a statewide day of action, March and general strike. So that mm -hmm. also in itself is another action for folks if you don't feel comfortable protesting, participate in the strike because that is also a huge component of it and it is statewide. If you can't make it to Seattle, we are also encouraging folks to start uh, marches in their own communities if they feel uh, willing to do that and and want to. So, and it is, yes, going to be a day of action in the name of Black Lives. So there will be a lot of information rolling out. Um, mm -hmm. So please stay tuned for that and we will update everyone as soon as we can. Awesome. You all have, uh, you all have made an active decision not to not to physically show up at a lot of protests. And it does not say that some of your members have not. But um, one thing that, that I heard that you brought up is we're still in the midst of a pandemic. COVID-19 is still real. There is no vaccine. There is nothing um, that will protect us from safety with that. 
How important is it to you all um, that people stay safe during this pandemic and still protest and still rise up? Right. I mean, it, for me, at least, um, and I would say for the board, it's like the number one priority. Mm -hmm. Um, I think our stance, I mean, initially we were, we weren't encouraging people to go out for that very reason, because we know that in our communities as black people, uh, we are dying at alarming rates right. and we did not want to put pressure on folks who might, may have felt uncomfortable already going out there to say, no, you need to be out there. That's something that they really cannot risk. Um, but I think has things have gone on and we have witnessed what we've been seeing in the city and we have been right. in these meetings and we have been working. Um, we have all made the tough decision and the sacrifice really um, to be like, this is something that we just feel like we have to do. And it's not something we're taking lightly, which is why, as Marlon said, we are really taking the time to do everything we can to make sure that there is PPE for everybody, actively handing it out if we need to. And also still putting on that strong message that you do not need to show up if you do not want to. Yes. Um, it is more than just this one March. It is more than just that one day. Um, mm -hmm. But this is what we feel like we need to do to really push this momentum and this movement forward and continue it on to really make sure that the demands we're making are met. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. I want to take it to a question. Uh, Molly Trueblood uh, looks like she is on YouTube. Do you think the proposed congressional legislation to register police brutality nationally will make a difference? What other policy moves are crucial? Mm. Any thoughts on that question? Well, you, oh. No, go ahead. Go ahead, please. <laughs> I know, right? We do that all the time. Um, you know, there, there is this concern where um, uh, law enforcement officers who have been found to, you know, violate the community's trust, you know, have violated, you know, black and brown bodies and who are actually, you know, disciplined for that actions seems to easily find another job in a neighboring city or in another state um, and then impose those same belief systems and practices in, in those new agencies. And so um, a national uh, um, database of some sort to, to track that um, would be good. I, I, would, I, I, I would like to understand more about that. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear that somebody um, posted that because I would definitely like to hear more about that. Um, there are so many policies that exist within uh, government agencies and law enforcement agencies that need um, serious scrutiny. Um, and there, you know, part of our demands and part of the demands of the community is more community involvement. Um, and so the, there are a lot of agencies, there are a lot of cities that does not have um, much community involvement or there's specific types of community members, you know, those who are, you know, in close proximity to the power, um, who are at the table. Um, but more people, um, particularly people uh, from communities who are greatly impacted by these, you know, policies uh, at disproportionate rates need to be the ones at the table. And that's something that we're really bringing into the conversation is that these policies need to be reviewed and the conversation we've been held as to how these um, policies disproportionately impacting our communities of color, particularly our black communities. Awesome, thank you. Just going back to some of the comments, um, summer home, we need change in our policy, police forcing, police forcing and judicial system. I never want to see again what happened to George Floyd or any other black or brown person. My sympathies. Thank you for that, Rose Marie. Yes, transparency for accountability. Thank you for that, Skylar Smith. Distrust from both sides, and those were uh, comments related to talking about the mayor's office and SPD. Uh, Marina Kovic. I hope I said that right. Thank you so much for that, Ebony. That was your comment on that, Bibbs. I really appreciate this nuanced conversation. Thank you for that. Um, what? 
What are ways that white folks can decenter themselves from, I don't want to say from the fight because they need to be in it, but what are what are ways that white folks can decenter themselves and decenter their voices and help support and uplift black voices and brown voices? Hmm. I know. Asked, that's I know. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, we get asked this question a lot in all avenues. Um, yes. How can white people help and mm. what their role should be? I mean, first and foremost, I'm going to I'm going to be real about it um, since I was out there last night. The first and immediate thing white people can do is make sure that folks are being as uh safe as possible in regards to COVID-19 prevention. That means wearing a mask at all times. That means having hand sanitizer. That means if you need to smoke or vape, getting out of the crowd to do that. That means, um, you know, not using this opportunity just to gather with people just because people are out right now. We are here for a reason um, right. and we need to remember um, even in our exhaustion and in our maybe dazed and confused state of all that's happening in the confusion, we need to remember that we are out here, not because we're tired of being in a pandemic, but because Black people are dying and continue to die. And that needs to be constantly um, the forefront of why we're out there. So while it has been great to see so many people supporting, and I'm not... Mm -hmm. uh, putting shame on that, that that needs to be first and foremost. But in terms of the long term um, and in terms of how to be more effective in your direct action, I think it does come from looking to those community leaders, again, looking at their demands. How do you make an impact on that? Who do you need to call? Who do you need to follow? Um, and making sure, yeah, that the demonstrations you are participating in are associated with, with those leaders in the community and that they have an, an agenda and a structure and a mission and a goal, because that too is a part of direct action. Not to say that the sustained, you know, demonstrations are negative either. Um, it's all a part of it. It's all a part of the moving piece, um, but there's more to it than that. Um, Aaron Shafkin, I mean, I think black people ask white people do that all the time, but they ain't listening. Maybe white folks need to answer that question and teach other white folks. Are y'all really teaching them? Mm -hmm. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> I'm not I'm not debating. I'm just saying, are you really teaching them? Again, that is a Danny Terrell thing. I'm <laughs> asking that question. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with that, though. I'll agree with that for myself, yes. Maybe white <laughs> folks do need to also be the ones doing that, because, you know. Yes. And really, like, teaching folks the way that you need to teach folks. Um Aisha, Bayisha, I love that name, by the way. I really appreciate every part of this conversation. Thank you all so very much. You are welcome. Back to Molly Trueblood. Thank you. I will advocate for more community involvement as well. Um, outside of the march that's happening June 12th, there are some events that take on a different form of protest and take it to the streets. You all are doing Juneteenth celebrations. Mm -hmm. Um and Seattle Black Gay Pride. Can you talk a little bit about that also? Um, and we have to have balance. As we are in the streets and fighting, there are different ways that we need to protest. We know that arts and entertainment is actually a form of protest. So I appreciate the balance that you all are also giving us. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know it's on the website also. Right, um, and we can provide a link for that as well. So Thank I you. have been uh, mainly, yeah, I've been mainly in charge of uh, scheduling our Black Pride event that's happening on June 20th. Um, again, we'll finalize the time on that soon as we get things rolling, but we have a lovely group of performers who will be, there will be music, there will be drag, there will be some more DJ sets, there will be some dancing. Um, awesome. And the whole week of Juneteenth, a little bit of context uh, over the past year, our chapter has been working on an education and outreach program for the 2020 census. And so Juneteenth week is being hosted by multiple uh, black organizations who are a part of a black caucus. And we decided that while a lot is happening, we're in a pandemic, the census uh, has <laughs> been pushed back that we need to take some time, yeah, for ourselves to celebrate ourselves and to just get community more involved. 
Um, so the entirety of Juneteenth week will be from June 15th to June 21st. Every single day, there will be different opportunities for folks to participate, talks, uh, movie screenings, panels, yoga classes, dance classes, performances. Um, so yes, that is the that is the page to keep updated on. Uh, the Urban League is also facilitating information as well. Uh, so keep updated on that. And I'm I'm really excited for that. I I'm like waiting. I'm itching for yes. it. I need it. Like <laughs> after yeah. all of this, yeah. I'm I'm excited. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't, we, we've been here for about an hour and I don't believe in keeping people too long. I know I said till 4.30, but I, I think this is a lot for people to chew on. Um, if you need to get in contact with Black Lives Matter, you can go to their website, www.blacklivesseattle.org. Um, what are ways that folks can donate uh, money, resources, help? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can go through you can have the donation. Through the yeah, and the, the link is right there in the screen. Um, you can donate to the general fund. You know, again, the bail uh, fund that we uh, had open um, to respond to people who were being arrested during um, these times, this demonstration and protest, or whatnot. Um, that's uh, full. We, uh, we fulfilled that, and we've been using that money to. Um, um, uh, respond to people's uh, bail requests. So, um, but you can donate to our general fund, which you know continues to be used for a number of things uh, and resources and supplies and that. And so, um, yeah, that you can uh, see. How, um, yeah, that that link right there is on the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, and if people uh, want to request bail money for a loved one, family member, someone um, one of that has been rising up in the street, how do they get in contact with you um, as an organization? Right there. Right there. <laughs> yeah. You know that was my plug in. I could throw that in there. Um, yeah. Yes. Also, I would it's, say. Oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say ahead. on the website as well uh, for the Freedom Fund, there's also a phone number as well as the email um, on there. So if you need a call, that's also available. Good. Um, two more questions. One question is, is there anything that you all, you want people to know about Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County? Um, I think as Black Lives Matter as an organization, people get a lot of misconceptions, a lot of things wrong. Um, is there something that you want to say, like, this is what you actually need to know about what we're doing and who we are? I can do that if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, as I as I said in the because, again, there's there's a history. There technically has been a chapter before this one, uh, right. which is important to know. But. Black Lives Matter Seattle and Black Lives Matter Seattle King County are the same exact thing, or exact same thing, um, and that is us. Uh, it is one and the same for that. Uh, we just include King County in our name to be specific about who we are fighting for and representing. Um, so that is one and the same. Um, and that, yes, we were founded in end of 2017, started working in 2018. Uh, we are a 501c4 registered in the state of Washington. We are a nonprofit organization. That is all legit. Um, and I mean, I think that's really all I need to say. We're out here and we're doing the work. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to pull up that comment again from Marina Kovic. Uh, thank you all. FYI, the company Evergreen Herbal is matching donations to Black Lives Matter Seattle King County right now. Just send your receipts to their Facebook DM. Um, thank you all. Uh, last question is one of my most favorite questions in the world, especially when I talk to Black folks. What is your joy and where does your joy live right now? I know, I know it's a hard question to answer during these times, but I think it's important for us as we talk about what is not right, we have to remember what is right. Mm -hmm. Marlon, you wanna go first on that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, my, my joy is um, 
is being able to make it home, actually. Um, it's it's a concern uh, every time, you know, we leave our houses and it's a joy to make it home in one piece. And um, I'm, this all of this work is to uh, further uh, emphasize the need for us to feel safe um, and and to um, be uh, move about this 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 these lands uh, freely. And so uh, this work is um, coming home. And so getting home every day uh, safely is my joy. Awesome, thank you. Um, I would say for me, I think it's um, remembering that I'm that I'm more than this work. Um, I think being more known in what I'm doing right now, it's a little bit weird getting that type of recognition. And I think um, since it's just been kind of consuming everything, um, I got to do an interview actually this week with someone um, as I'm a musician and she wanted to speak to me about my music. And it was kind of like a weird whiplash for me of like, oh, right, like this is something that's a part of me. It's something that I do and that I love and really is my greatest passion as much as I love organizing work. Um, I'm more than that. And so I think it's about recentering who I am. I'm a queer person. I'm a trans person. I'm a black person. I'm a Latinx person. I'm the child of an immigrant. I'm a musician, an artist, a writer. I'm all those things. And I am more than just fighting for my livelihood right now. Um, I'm more than that. And I think that's important for everyone to recognize that all black people are more than just this work. That's right. Ebony Miranda, Marla Brown, uh, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County. Look, it's been a, I've been talking a lot for the past two days. <laughs> right now, I've been talking a lot. Uh, Black Lives Matter, King Seattle King County. Uh, you all are on the board. Thank you for your time and your energy. Um, just to talk through some things. If you all want to stay connected with them, please visit www. BlackLivesSeattle.org to donate, to find out more, to find out more about the um, rally, the march, the protest on June 12th, and to find out more about June, June, June celebrations and Seattle Black Pride. Um, I am Danny Terrell with Introductive Forum for Arts and Ideas. We thank you for tuning in. We thank you for giving us your time. Um, please make sure you follow Black Lives Matter, you follow CD Forum, and find out what we're doing in the community. Peace, everybody. Bye. Have a really beautiful time. My joy is that I'm hoping that going at the end of the year to continue having these important. Yes, those will be. Thank you for that, Gina Williams. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>